on Transformers One, Michael Bay, um, he had this huge stack of printouts, and we we were, we were doing, you know all the tricks of the trade back then as well, but we'd print everything out so he could look at it. And he was like going through the stack of work and like one image after another was like incredible. Um, and he, and he was like, no, no, no F F this doesn't work. Fail. No, this isn't my movie. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, my work's coming up. I'm going to get so slammed. And he, and this image came up that I had done. And I only bring up the story cause like it's kind of the shitty, really quick sketch they had done. I had taken this kind of the old space shuttle bay and I put a Megatron in there, but it was like really fast and sketchy and like I had no time to do it and I was panicked and I just had to get it out <laughs> there. And he looked at it and he goes, This is my fucking movie right here. And it was like <laughs> it was like the worst drawing I had done on the movie, and everybody was kind of shocked and was like, Really? That one? Please welcome James Klein design supervisor at Lucasfilm. James is an absolute legend in film industry. This is a special one for me because James is one of those few artists that inspired me to become a digital artist myself. Hope you're gonna enjoy this episode as much as I did. Let's go! Speaking of, of that subject, you know, and we kind of started the conversation with this, you know, I, in 2003, that's where I started doing digital art and, uh, okay. and, you know, Seijin forums and concept art, concept art.org. Those are the places I discovered. And obviously, you know, speed, speed painting, um, thread. Yeah. I mean, that's all pretty early days. Yeah. Three, like, I don't. I think I was like 99 or 2000 before I picked up a laptop and started painting on it. So yeah, that's still early days. Yeah. But I remember that started this rabbit hole of like, who else is there? And then I saw you and then I saw Dylan Cole and then I saw <laughs> Ryan Church. It's like, oh, my mind is blown, you know, <laughs> blown away. And uh, yeah, yeah it, it, uh, it seemed to happen like it seemed to happen overnight. And, and the earliest I can remember is kind of, uh, is seeing, uh, Craig's stuff. Um, I think I was actually on, might've predated minority report. I might've just started on minority report, but a lot of guys in the office were still doing like traditional. And I mean like stone age traditional, like <laughs> vellum marker, with like gouache highlights and stuff like that's just how it was done and then we would like photocopy it and actually predating like photoshop layers we would we would like take a photo photocopy and then we'd cut out a piece and then photocopy that additional layer on oh, top I of see. it if we needed a change like it was it was crazy how like old school it was but then maybe like 99 or 2000 I think I saw Craig's stuff somewhere and maybe there was artists doing, you know, digital work, but nobody was taking it to this like master level that Craig was doing. And uh, yeah. I, I saw like some, some architectural pieces. And I was like, I, I gotta, I gotta make this happen for myself. And, um, and one of the early guys that helped me actually was, uh, do you know, Tim flattery? Yeah, of course. Of yeah. Course. So Tim, Tim was like a big help in terms of like, I mean, the film industry is all about, as you probably know, is, is like all about who, you know, I mean, you need to be talented yep. and you need hopefully not be a total asshole. And, yep. but, but ultimately <laughs> it's, it's the connections that you make with other people that are, are so important. And I was fortunate enough to be on a film with, with Tim or Tim might've heard my name. And, uh, we worked together on, um, mission to Mars. This was, uh, an early predate of what the film would become. Um, but, uh, but he had like a, he had like a laptop 
And I was just blown away that he was doing Photoshop, like on a laptop. I was like, what? This is, this is amazing. And it, it was like a magical box of like lights. And uh, so I would, I would ask him to use it during lunch. Like, can I, do you mind if I, I couldn't afford a laptop at the time. Right. Uh, and I was like, can I, can I use this during lunch? And do you mind showing me some things? He had no problem with it. Like super like gracious guy, um, still is to this day. And, um, and I was just like scrambling to try to learn as much of it as I could. Um, cause I, I, I never thought I'd like ever get to a Craig Mullins level and nobody has, but I wanted to try to figure out just the smallest percentage of what he was doing right? and exploit that as much as I could. Um, yeah, I remember exploring all of those names that were basically one of my main inspiration to get into digital art, you know, because I started, I, I used to draw as just for fun, you know, yeah. I was playing role playing games, drawing my characters for those games, you know, that kind of stuff. Cool. Pretty much what most the kids do. Um, and I remember, well, the first thing that made me discover digital art was Cision forums and like being completely blown away. Those are also like this forums on Polish on Polish side. It's called Max 3D. Yeah, that's where um, quite a bunch of like Polish artists were posting the work, including some of the guys from Platic Image, you know, okay, um, all of those guys. And that was sort of like the discovery process. But but one of the things that I remember the most is like, I could clearly see whose whose strengths are where. And, you know, for like photorealistic, amazing landscapes and like, quote unquote, best uh, matte paintings, that was Dylan Call for me, right? Yeah. Like the granddaddy oh, yeah. of, 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 of digital art, uh, Craig Mullins, his sketches were just like, oh my God, like how is he, how is that even possible? You yeah. Know? <laughs> how can you do that? And then you were one of those artists that I always admired for for the design sense. Like you were, you there was there was always something in your in your paintings that no one else could capture in terms of like how it was designed. You know, your vehicle designs and and landscape design, like buildings. All of those things were just so we, like weird and different than what you would see normally. Oh. Like, oh, how is he doing that? Like I have no idea how to design. You know, that's very and, kind um, of you, dude. That's like. Wow, that's cool. I mean, as artists, like we we have a hard time being um, like objective about our own work. Like I have a hard time thinking about like not that I sit around thinking about my own art, all the time, <laughs> but like I have a hard time. Like I can understand like Dylan. Like I could ev whenever I see a painting of Dylan's, I understand. I know who that is. I know Ryan Church, and I know yep. you know Craig Mullins. I know right away. But when I look at my work, it just kind of seems like it's it's always like a little diluted or like, I just don't see like the perspective behind it. But when I hear people like you say that, that's, that's cool. I mean, no, you pull up any of your minority report worries, like, Oh my God. Yeah. I, I totally get it. You know? <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. yeah that it's... was, that was a dream job for sure. That was like, like, let me ask you, let me ask you this. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a, like a good, like roll in moment as well. Um, what made you want to be an artist? Like where did, where did it all started for you? I mean, it started as early as I can remember, honestly. Um, I was just one of those kids that drew in, in, in class and probably got in trouble for drawing in class. And, um, my mother probably promoted it fairly early on. She was a school teacher. Um, and she, she thought it was cool that I, that I drew. I remember early on, she went to like a local, um, a newspaper printing facility and somehow mm -hmm. she got this huge roll of unprinted newspaper and it came in this huge, again, this huge roll and I would just roll it out as long as I wanted, and I would just kind of start from one end and just draw like the That's left cool. to right, um, drawing all kinds of stuff like, you know, creatures, dinosaurs, landscapes, like all the kind of stuff like an eight year old would draw. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then honestly, I think the big game game changer was like seeing empire strikes back and, and going, Oh my God, how did they, 
how did they do all this for one thing? Like, how am I seeing what I'm seeing? Like, how is that all possible? And then like, where does that start? And I, and I, I think I still have the book in my office somewhere, but it's the, um, the empire strikes back sketchbook. Like they did these sketchbooks and it was all mm-hmm. Joe Johnston and, uh, Nilo, uh, and, and all their work is mostly Joe Johnston's just sketches. And for like a kid to be able to see that it started with a sketch, which is like the only, the only kind of thing I knew was like just sketching, um, was kind of a, was kind of mind blowing that, Oh my God, like the ad at Walker started with a sketch. Is that, is that really, truly how it started? Um, so I think that kind of spun me into this other direction of like, designing kind of crazy sci-fi worlds or, or, or something. Um, just being influenced by film at that time and being a kid in the eighties was like, it was right. a kid in the candy store. It was so much good stuff. Yeah. I, I, I didn't realize you can actually work in the industry, like where it's all coming from until like very late, almost before I started doing digital art. And, um, but yeah, for sure having those influences in the 80s i think it was a golden era of film honestly oh man yeah i mean any schwarzenegger movie (laughs) (laughs) from predator to like yeah yeah like they were they were so creative they they didn't necessarily always get it like right in terms of like the finesse of stuff but they were I felt like they were trying so many different things, you know? Yeah. Um, they would try just crazy stuff like, you know, labyrinth or, um, like blade runner was just such a departure from what you would think uh, a science fiction film should be about. And that just spun it into this whole film noir sci-fi trend, yeah. which still is, is happening today. But, yeah, it felt like they, it was kind of the Wild West and they were just trying as many things um, and going in as many directions as possible. So, Yeah, I remember, I mean, I was briefly working with uh, Ridley Scott um, on the, like the poster, posters for the new uh, Blade Runner. Oh, cool. Uh, it, was, it was this collab that I did with, with Ash Torp. And I remember meeting uh, Ridley for the, like for the first time. It was like, oh my god, I'm meeting a legend again. Yeah. Like, just just being an absolute nerd, <laughs> uh, you know. It's like the uh, crazy, crazy stuff. But it was funny because we had like this long conversation before we even went into talking about what we we're gonna do. Like, literally, I, right. I sat there just like like a kid, like in front of like you know his grandpa, yeah, listening to war stories, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, and just just going on and on about like some cool cool stories of you know how the how he how he was making movies you know stories about his brother all that stuff and but i remember this one thing he said um which relates to what we're talking about um it was when he was offered to do alien uh the first one Mm -hmm. and he was just like why would i do a sci-fi movie because like back back in those days like in late 70s before star wars came out you would have those like cringy sci-fi with some you know half naked women running around and like yeah really really like what is that right yeah like, is that what we're doing right but like, then he saw star wars like he saw the new hope i was like okay i i get it now <laughs> you know? yeah i mean it changed i'm sure everybody's perception every like film director's perception of what what a movie can be uh, yeah and it yeah, it created or it gave rebirth to like a genre of, of kind of space fantasy. Like I don't see star Wars as science fiction. It's, it is more fantasy. Uh, yeah. and I think I only say that cause I think it's a quote from George Lucas himself. So you, <laughs> you got to go with yeah. the man when he says that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, I constantly get asked like, um, well the physics wouldn't work on that thing or, and and your my answer always is like, well, yeah, physics are great, and you've got to you got to adhere to something. But in Star Wars, it really isn't about the physics; it's about the kind of the storytelling and yeah. you know the the kind of 
genre of slapping Buck Rogers with World War II or um, Kurosawa. Uh, there is it's more cinema than it is like true science, and yeah. that's where the kind of the imagination comes from from those original films. It's just like the sheer just fantasy of it all was just fantastic. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those genres that like never focused on the technical aspects of anything. Like you would be introduced with technology that would never be explained. You would just know how it works by looking at it, right? And yeah. seeing it in action. Yeah, yeah. The way they constructed the shots or the, the vehicles or the sets or the environments, they became so believable that you you um, you didn't concern yourself with like the physics behind it you just went with it right um, yeah and i think ridley well, scott did that in alien like you really believed those worlds those kind of well weathered kind of dark oily environments you felt like you're on like an oil platform or something uh, yeah yeah what, what he did with alien was was crazy I, it's it's kind of funny because all of it came out before i was even born so for me yeah. it was like a re rediscovery process when i was you know, like eight or 10. Right. Um, looking at those VHS tapes, <laughs> like hiding it from my mom. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I saw, I think I saw aliens in the, I don't know what year was aliens, 85, maybe, uh, 86. So, um, I'm I was still shitting my diapers back then. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was the ripe age. I think I was like, uh, I think I was 12 or something or 10. Um, and I couldn't believe it. It was just, it was like, it was like seeing star Wars, but like a hard R star Wars, which right. at that age, you're like just discovering kind of like a bigger world of like violence and, and like swearing and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, I just ate it up. It was fantastic. Were there any other movies that had like a significant, you have a significant affection to from that time that like really, you know, pushed you towards this is what I want to do. Um, I mean, as a kid, it, it was probably those, those kind of movies. Like I, I loved, uh, I loved anything like with Schwarzenegger and it, like Conan the Barbarian. I thought like a oh, yeah. world building <laughs> kind of movie was just fantastic. Um, obviously star Wars and, and anything by, by Jim Cameron at that point, like, um, was hugely influential because Jim, I think brought, uh, a, a hard science to his films. Like, right. Those were real science fiction movies and they felt like those, those things would work in a real world scenario. Um, so yeah, all that stuff was, but I, I liked, I liked bad movies too. Again, I loved like, Demolition Man and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, the Running Man. Anything with the Running Man, man yeah. in it. <laughs> like I, I love those kind of trashy, pulpy kind of films too. That didn't have the production value of like an Aliens or a Star Wars, but I really, I, I thought the the stories were just kind of fantastic and just insane. I keep on saying yeah. fantastic a lot, which I never say. So <laughs> I'm going to roll with it. You're going to get a lot of fantastic. Let's roll with it. Uh, did you ever went like, did you, did you ever watch, uh, or been into the martial arts movies too? Um, yeah. I mean, Von Damme was, was, was great. Um, like blood sport was great. I mean, I was never really into martial arts myself. I did, I did a keto in, in college for a couple of years. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like anything with like blood sport was a good one. Um, like I saw, uh, do you, have you seen the, the original iron monkey film? Um, wow. it was probably from like the mid nineties, like, um, it's like Shaolin monks, like, and throwing stars and, and so you know maybe i i went through so many vhs vhs like bootleg uh tapes back then yeah it was just yeah it was whatever was available we would watch you know right it was like oh the new movie came out you know um 
Well, you didn't have movies were obviously a big you influence. You just didn't have uh, the library that we ha- we didn't have access to like no. everything. So if you no. saw like you know Van Damme's next film, like you were like, oh my god, I didn't even know this existed. <laughs> like and it was out for like ten years, and you're like, this is this is amazing. This is like. It felt like you were the first one to come across it, but uh, there was no like a database you could go to, like, "Hey, let no. me see what other Van Damme movies are out there." No, like, you would oh, just like... you would just fall upon it, and then like if if you liked it, then you just watched it over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because it's not like they would list it in the library how many movies Van Damme did, you know? <laughs> no, you could you could not. You could not do any search whatsoever. Um, There's no Dewey Decimal System for Van Damme, that's for sure. But yeah, yeah, we had the we didn't have Blockbuster when I was a kid. They would, I think, I think video stores started um, at least when I was growing up in Eugene, Oregon. They were part of like grocery stores. Like they would have like a little annex, like a little, I don't know, it like. Our local store, like the old liquor section, like the hard liquor section became the video section for some reason. So we were able to rent videos from our local grocery store. Um, And, you know, there was probably like, I don't know, 100 titles or 150 titles. And you could just kind of look over the the covers. So, like, I have, like, this image of, like, just different... um, you know, VHS film, film covers, like what, I had no idea what it was, but if the, if it kind of grabbed me, then I would want to watch it. So it was like all based on just that image on the cover. Um, right. I think that's why I got into like, you know, nightmare and Elm street movies or something. Cause you would just be like, what is this, this dude with this like scarred face and these yeah. like, you know, these, these spiky uh, knives on the end of a glove, like you didn't know anything about Freddy Krueger only from like that, that image. And, and, um, there was some more, I guess to that end, there was just more mystery behind it, you know? Yeah. Um, you didn't know anything about it until you actually sat down and, and watched it. But, um, I sometimes wonder if that's the, um, that's the reason why we used to have those you know, film superstars back then, because like, as we're just saying, there was no library of like the list of things you could watch and, and have like a better access to like trailers. I don't think trailers, I mean, you would only see them in the, in the movie theaters, right? Mm. If, if anything, and that's just by accident. And then pretty much else, anything else would be just looking at the cover. And if you would see a recognizable figure like Van Damme or Schwarzenegger or Stallone, you know, it's like, oh my god, you know, yeah, he has a new movie. Let's watch it, right? Like you would, uh, my my father would get the like the Sunday paper, uh, and in the paper they had like the calendar section, and they would have all the upcoming films. And it was just black and white, you know, printed newsprint, uh, yeah. and you would see like Return of the Jedi on there, and you'd be like, holy shit, there's another Star Wars movie, like that was your access to it was like a, just a one pager in the back of a newspaper. Yeah. Like that, that's kind of that idea now just seems so like simple and naive and like, um, impossible in, in kind of today where you get, you get like information coming at you from everywhere. But uh, yeah, it's abundance of information uh, right now. It's just so difficult to, follow and because like there's so much stuff out there as well you can compare one one movie to another almost instantly you don't it's not like you watch a movie and then time passes by you watch like over and over because that's the only movie you have that that's new yeah and and, yeah yeah. i i definitely try to i try to get my kids to do that too i try to get them to like uh watch the same movie over and over again like i did because you really start to understand like the dialogue and how a movie is built and shot and right. progresses from the first to second to third act and i try to get them to watch like the same thing over and over again doesn't seem to be working but 
but you know, on the flip side, they get access to like just about everything. Like that, yeah. that's kind of mind blowing too. It's like, um, and then I get to like, I get the benefit of introducing new stuff to them. Like we watched alien and aliens, uh, a couple months ago. And it was like, it was like mind blowing to watch it through the eyes of somebody that had no idea where the movies were going. Right. You know, like yeah. watching, watching the chest burster scene in Alien with my kids. Oh man. They had no idea it was coming. They kind of felt like something bad was going to happen. I think like my, my 10 year old was like, yeah, this doesn't feel right. Something, something bad is going to happen. And you're like, just wait, it's coming. <laughs> Blood bursting out of someone's chest. Um, but yeah. Do they laugh at that stuff these days? I mean, the, I mean, look, I, Alien is a, maybe not a greatest example because the visual effects were done so well and they still hold up even even till today. Um, but when you watch some of the older movies, the sci-fi movies or fantasy movies, like, oh, like this is not looking as good as I remember. <laughs> yeah, they're like, I mean, I they surprise me because um, I'll, I'll show them something like, uh, like we watched John Carpenter's The Thing like a month ago and I was like, Oh, they're going to be totally bored. They're going to think the visuals are just corny, but they, they kind of went with it. Um, I think right. because the story is so strong and because the, the way that movie builds, like it's really a slow burn, like the dog shows up and there's a guy with a rifle and a helicopter is trying to kill the dog. And you're like, what is something, you know, some bad's going to happen but it doesn't happen right away. It kind of just right. slowly builds. So, um, that, that kind of tension, I think still plays today is as good as anything. And as long as you have that tension, um, through, through the storytelling, I think people are going to, are going to buy it. Um, yeah. But conversely, if there's like a new movie that just doesn't have any of that, uh, the, and it could be like a, brilliant brilliantly looking movie it could be just like the best looking movie you've ever seen but if it doesn't have that kind of tension um behind it they, they'll be bored so mm, i think visuals are certainly one thing but if you have a story a compelling story with compelling characters i think uh it doesn't matter what generation you're hitting that they'll, they'll fall for it right yeah um that's true. Yeah, there's some of the movies that come out and, you know, some of the directors take the choices of having like a slower build up or maybe just like explaining stories through the different means. And if they don't have that, you know, catching moment that catches your attention right away, like it's very difficult for most of the people just like to sit through and enjoy the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of um, there's a lot of pressure on filmmakers just from my point of view um, that they have to have, you know, so many things in their little 90 minute, 130 minute film. Like they, yeah. there's so much pressure to have A, B, C and D in their films that sometimes they're not allowed to just kind of, I, I feel like they're not allowed to just stick with kind of one direction. They get notes and notes and notes that it become, it compiles and becomes maybe a little more, um, there's just a little too much there than, than mm -hmm. need, needs to be. Uh, right. Yeah. That makes but, sense. Um, but, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I was going to just say John Carpenter again, like his films. I mean, again, I, I love kind of the camp pulpy nature of John Carpenter and, uh, David Cronenberg. Um, but they do have like one kind of single idea and then they build it on that one idea yeah. it doesn't doesn't kind of flower into like 30 different ideas yeah it's very I, I i remember i mean when you watch the movies from from the 80s and 90s they they don't overcomplicate things for no reason like yeah. the story is based on usually one principal idea that carries the whole the whole film through right and it's very easy to follow I yeah feel. Um, how is that, I mean, I know it influenced you to what kind of drawings you would do, but was there any moment where you were like, okay, I can actually make a living doing that. This is mm. sort of like the direction I want to go with. 
Because like everyone's so different, right? Yeah, yeah. Which makes it great that everybody comes from different backgrounds. Um, I, uh, like every high school kid, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do with my life. <laughs> I got pressure from my parents. Like, you got to think about getting a legitimate job and going to a legitimate be a doctor. <laughs> college. Yeah. And I was like, there's no fucking way I'm going to be able to be a doctor. Like, I don't, I don't have the grades for it. I don't have the yeah. ambition for it. Um, but then I didn't know what to do. Like what creative field would I go into? Like, would I go into like graphic design and work for like an ad agency? Like I didn't really understand until there was a representative from, uh, the art center college of design in Pasadena. And they came to my art class that I was taking in high school. And it was like a slideshow and, and, the stuff I saw was like, it, it just changed my whole perspective of like right. the world. Like there were people designing like cars, products, there was illustrators, there was like all these artists, <clears throat> excuse me, that were coming from all these different, you know, from all over the world, which was really cool to see that it wasn't just like the small microcosm of Americans. There were just, there were Europeans, there were Asians, all kind of smashed together doing like super creative stuff. And, um, uh, and I just wanted to be a part of it. I didn't know what it was, but, um, myself and another, uh, fellow student, we took a, it was called like a Saturday high class. So it was high school kids. I was able to take like a high, uh, Saturday course it was like kind of a crash course to see if this was something you'd be interested in. And at the same time, you could kind of build your portfolio if that was right. what you want to do. So, um, uh, yeah, the, after the first class, it was like an industrial design introduction class. I was like, Oh shit, this is what I want to do. And nice. fortunately I was able to sell it to my old man because it looked legitimate. <laughs> it was like dudes and like, you know, working for GM, wearing a tie, looking over like the schematics of like a car design. Like that was something he could understand. Right. So um, it wasn't like a creature design for a movie with some, you know. Yeah. Or I wasn't like, gonna, looking right. I wasn't going to like grow over. dreadlocks and just <laughs> smoke dope and surf all day. And yeah. I don't know, shape surfboards or something like that was not the creative thing that uh, he was hoping for his son. So, um, I went off and kind of did some undergraduate, um, at a junior college. And then at, uh, I wanted like the real college life. So I went to UCSB in Santa Barbara for a year and I, and I just got restless after a while. I was like, I just need to build my portfolio and I need to focus. And I was able mm -hmm. to get into art center and I started in automotive design. I thought I wanted to do car design. Like I thought, I'm going to like design the next Ferrari or Lamborghini. <laughs> um, and then I soon realized after like a year, I was like, Oh, I'm going to be designing taillight housings on Hondas for, for, yeah, that's, for 20 years, sound good at all. which I'm sure like I would have been totally fine doing. And there's like super talented guys that work in those industries and I would never be at their level, but it just wasn't for me. And kind of halfway through school, I, I switched more into industrial design and then I started to take more photography and film classes and illustration classes. I was able to somehow sweet talk my Dean into allowing me to take different courses. Cause there was no, there was no entertainment design, right. Um, major there. Um, it just didn't exist. Um, but, uh, but art center just had all these different things to offer that I just wanted to do. Um, they had earliest uh, Silicon Graphics alias, which was like used in product design and auto. They were starting to design cars in, you know, spline based right. modeling. And I hated it at first. Like I would spend like 12 hours in, in the computer lab and like get like the front bumper, like kind of molded out. Like it was too slow for me. And, but I knew that like, that's where things were going to go. I knew that there was something there. So art center allowed me to kind of be able to tackle a few of those different disciplines. Um, and then by the time I graduated, I kind of had this more customized portfolio for, um, for doing more 
film or game based stuff. Um, I had an instructor again, going back to like uh, so much of the industry is about who, you know, like I had an yeah. instructor, uh, Doug June, who, uh, was working, um, at this visual effects house called rhythm and Hughes in LA. He hooked me up with like a, an interview. And I, so I kind of freelanced for them for like a year. I worked for Activision for about a year doing some titles and just kind of getting my feet wet of like trying to understand the industry, but, um, never really like a foothold on one thing or the other for the first couple of years. Sure. Right. 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 Did, the did, the uh, well, I guess, well, one of the things that, uh, it's almost like a common denominator is that most of the artists that I admire from the early, early times are like art center graduates. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's terrible. Like, uh, yeah, it's Art Center or it's like CCS um, yeah. in Detroit. Um, <clears throat> your or Cal Arts. It was like it. There was no gnomon at the time. It was just like, nope. oh man, I've got to go like in a hundred thousand dollar debt to go to this school to get this education because there just there was nothing really online. There was no access to things no. back then. <laughs> um. So yeah, like Art Center really was one of the only uh, venues. Not that there weren't artists that were working in the industry that, you know, didn't go to arts. There were like super talented guys that actually like were self-taught guys too. Right. Like uh, I think Matt Codd. I don't know if you know Matt Codd's name, but he worked on Judge Dredd and amazing artist. I think that dude was self-taught and was like, oh my God. Mm. Um why did I just waste a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> on education? That's always a question. How <coughs> different what it, what it was it uh, back then when you you were graduate? Uh, did you graduate from from uh, art center? Did you go all the way through? I or? did. Yeah, I did. I graduated with a like a bachelor's of science in industrial design. I think. Um, gotcha. I wanted the. I just wanted the piece of paper that said I was. Mm probably one to please my parents or something. But also like I, I saw guys that kind of like wouldn't graduate. They would leave like a year before and like start working in the industry. And I'm like, well, I could start making money now if I just left. But for me personally, I think it meant a lot to have some kind of degree, even though it meant right. nothing to an employer. Afterwards. No. <laughs> they, they do not care at they all. Don't. Um, so did you get offers like right, right, like through, through the school? Um, yeah, I, I interviewed with like DreamWorks. They were just starting up at the time. Um, Disney, I didn't want to do animation. I wanted to do, I just wanted to do live action. I got, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm going to leave them nameless because they, they were another instructor of mine that snuck me into the Batman uh, Batman Forever, maybe it was one of the terrible Batman movies. It's like George Clooney, <laughs> Batman and with Robin. Like, yeah, like I think it was George Clooney with like, didn't he have like nipples on his bat suit or something? Like it was, it was crazy. But what what happened was they snuck me onto the Warner Brothers lot. Like I was not supposed to be in the art department, and they're like, right. this is what the art department is, and like there was all these like. Uh, these amazing artists, Jacques Ray, uh, Harold Belka were designing like vehicle, like the Batmobile. Like I just saw the sketches and they were designing all these crazy sets for Gotham. And I was like, oh man, this is, this is what I want to do. And, nice. um, I think even the director, Joel Schumacher walked in and he was like, he gave me like a quick glance. I remember like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I felt like it's definitely my time to sneak out. But like just that that quick like introduction to seeing like artists around tables on a studio lot, like it it was just so uh, appealing and and enticing. Right. I wonder how it was back then when you would finish Art Center or you know get offers right where where, you're, where when you were going through it compared to now because like. Now you go to schools, you would go to art center, you know, Noman, any other school, right? Yeah. And the likelihood, I mean, 
one of the things that will happen is you're going to get the connections you're going to get to interface with with yep. with people in the industry but i think talking to some of the instructors that teach now because everything is so saturated yeah you know like what do you do uh, art center or you, you do online schools you know uh what ends up happening is like you have to start looking or like really really past the threshold in which people look for you yeah because otherwise it's like very difficult i wonder how it was back then when you were starting like was it difficult to land the gig was because the saturation was different right like there was not so so, so much of a competition out there when you were starting in the film industry there was i, I don't think it was a concept artist role specifically right you, you, you would be used to be called illustrators yeah. yeah yeah it was illustrators we the the union was the illustrators union illustrators and storyboard artists union it was uh 790 before it became the art directors union we got kind of meshed in with um with 800 with the art directors union right but at the time it was just the illustrators union we were called illustrators and you know a lot of our work was just that it was just illustrating like hey here's a location we need a little bit of a set extension here we're going to build a bit of a wall here what does that look like or we want to take this old mall and kind of redress it as a futuristic mall like what is that right like like it wasn't really rocket science like i feel like it is now like the world building is just so much bigger now yeah. um but it was it was a lot smaller back then and um and we just worked on films that didn't require the needs like that that a film does today um so you would typically just have one or two illustrators tops uh on a on a film yeah um, some set designers and yeah. set designers you'd have your assistant art directors art directors and the production designer but uh yeah i worked on films where you know the art department was was like 20 people or something um, and then as we got into like, uh, AI and minority report, the, the demand for visuals started to grow and therefore the art departments grew. And, yeah, uh, I think when we really started to use, um, you know, the Photoshop and like early 3d software packages, like everything kind of changed at that point too. Yeah, it was it almost all blew up from 2004, 2005 and on and that last 20 years of of how things how quickly things moved. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It's it's actually 20 years. It's not that quick. But yeah. then, like the yeah. progression of it though, you know, quite substantial. Yeah. Yeah, I mean Jurassic Park kind of changed it all. Um and like working with ILM like that that changed like my perception of like oh my god like like Dennis Muren created like a whole new industry by making yeah. a digital dinosaur, um, and then it just kind of grew from there. Um, but yeah, it, it did change quickly, and um, it still does change quickly. But um, but uh, hopefully. The thing that still remains is like you know good storytelling ultimately you can right. you can have like you can have like a really bad looking movie like visually um and if it's like a good story it doesn't matter but if you yeah. have like a really terrible story with like the best visuals for me personally like I, i'll never watch it again like there's no reason for me to like ever need to watch that but i will watch yeah I will watch like a B level movie, like, like the thing, um, over and over again. Um, with that said, I think the thing looks fantastic. Like Rob Bottin's creature work was fantastic, but, um, it's certainly not at the level of filmmaking today. Uh, yeah, for sure. But I don't know what my point is. I, I think, I think we've got, I think we, we have the ability to pretty much design everything. Yeah. But the challenge is to kind of figure out your little box that you work in and kind of make it as good as you can within that, within those parameters, within that box. 
Do you think that with the change of how things progressed in terms of how Photoshop, I mean, early versions of Photoshop were nowhere close to what it is now. It's so different and more advanced. And now it's like half of it is AI driven. <laughs> um, w w do you think that with all the sort of like advancements in hardware and software, like everything became easier and easier to use and you can work faster. Do you think that that's amplified by how the industry is moving as well? Do you feel like there's more pressure on artists? right now to produce fast yeah because like because like the, i'll explain why i'm asking this because like i i feel that um we're very close or maybe already past the threshold where um you have you can reach the level of craft in art and mm. illustration and design where it's good enough for most of the films like literally close oh. your eyes point randomly on art station yeah. Whatever you point on, that's you, you could be easily used for. You can for, kit batch a city in an afternoon, throw it in Blender, and it's right. going to look like almost camera ready, like imagery. Like yeah. And um, what's surprising is that like working with creative uh, people at the top, <clears throat> they kind of see right through that. Uh, Maybe it's their generation or where they are at that, that age, but um, they kind of see through the mechanics of it in a way. Right. And they're not looking for, um, they're not looking for like the prettiest picture. They know they'll, they'll get there eventually, you know, shooting their film and then in post-production, um, going to a post house and having them, you know, spend six months uh, yeah. developing the visuals. They'll get it down what they're looking for early on is like the storytelling behind things that's going to help them build their film when they go out and shoot it. Like they're looking for those story beat moments. Um, and again, this is just, I'm only speaking personally, uh, working with some of the people in the industry, but, right. um, that I have, uh, they're not looking for like, well, what kind of like Allen wrench bolt did you put on that? You know, <laughs> that little armature there. Like they're, they're looking for like the rough silhouette of things. And, um, I'm working with a director right now who he has a, a, um, history and visual effects. So he kind of, he knows all the tricks, right? He can kind of see through it all. And he's not concerned with like a beautiful, perfect image. Um, he's concerned with like, how is this going to help tell my story? And here, Here's also like a little secret about that. I've, it's taken me years and years to learn. It's like if you give a director like a beautiful, perfect image and you're like, oh, man, this is like the best shit I've ever done. Like, I can't wait to show this to somebody. And you present that to a director and they see it. Most of the time, their response is going to be like, oh, that's cool, but that's not what I wanted. Because yeah. you, haven't, you haven't allowed them to be a part of the conversation. You know, and like making movies, it's about collaboration. It's not like you just being in a dark room by yourself and like coming up with cool imagery. It's about listening to filmmakers, getting their vision on paper or, or on a screen and helping support their vision. Like that's what it's all about. It could be the crappiest little sketch, like um, like a story. Uh, I don't mind throwing his name out, but on Transformers one, Michael Bay, um, he had this huge stack of printouts and we, we were, we were doing, you know, all the tricks of the trade back then as well, but we print everything out so he could look at it. And he was like going through the stack of work and like one image after another was like incredible. Um, and he, and he was like, no, no, no F F this doesn't work. Fail. No, this is not my movie. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my work's coming up. I'm going to get so slammed. And he, and this image came up that I had done. And I only bring up the story because like, it's kind of the shitty, really quick sketch that I had done. I had taken this kind of the old space shuttle bay and I put a Megatron in there. But it was like really fast and sketchy. And like I had no time to do it. And I was panicked. And I just had to get it out <laughs> there. And he looked at it and he goes, 
this is my fucking movie right here. And it was like, <laughs> it was like the worst drawing I had done on the movie. And everybody was kind of shocked. And I was like, really that one. And I only say the story also because like the next image was, and I was feeling like really confident about myself, but the next image was mine as well. And he was like, but this one, this one gets an F <laughs> like, just like <laughs> flipped on me like overnight. But, but he, I, I think, I think Michael Bay gets, he gets um, a lot of flack for the kind of movies he does and the kind of person he is. But I've worked with him over the years and I really learned to appreciate him because he, he does have a really strong point of view and he, he does, he does respect the artist uh, and what they bring to his films. He has a right understanding of that. Um, He's a master of action and camera in terms of like having some of like bringing the action into the camera yeah. So it feels like action. He's absolutely the best. Well, and a lot of people have kind of like, you know, it's weird. Like a lot of directors will will uh, will criticize him, but then they'll they'll constantly try to copy his work. Like <laughs> it's really weird. Like, um, so I like some of his movies. Yeah, I, I did like I, the first Transformers. I did like the The Rock. You know, they're they're great. They're fun. Yeah, great movies. Yeah. And, Even the island, right? The island was great. Yeah, and and the way he moves the camera, he developed so many ways of like bringing films into like this this newer, faster genre. And yeah, it, not everybody's going to like it, and and but he he brought kind of like a, a a pace and a speed to films that hadn't been done before. Yeah, that's correct. That's true. Um, yeah, it's it, to me it's fascinating because like, you know, I I joined the industry, uh, the film industry quite late. Um, I think 2014 was when I uh, joined the union, or okay. maybe 15. Yeah. Uh, my first u real union show was Captain America. Yeah. Uh, Civil War. Okay. With uh, Owen Patterson as right. a production production designer, amazing guy. I love yeah. working with him. He did Matrix. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he did matrix he designed matrix um Amazing. and i remember even like but but even in those six years the industry changed dramatically because and that's another question that i have because like i remember on those early shows it was you know how it is in film right like 90 percent of the films just are never never made they just get canceled all the time yeah um, or they're shelved and, and yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they're reborn, but yeah, most of the time. Yeah. And and you, you hear those stories with like they start the art department, everyone's like super excited, and then the next day, like, <laughs> oh, we're shutting down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was fortunate to never have that happen to me. Uh, and I remember like early on being in the film industry, like I was maybe that's just me having a fortune to work on the movies that were longer. So like Captain America, that was my first union movie. That was like six months. Um then I was like four months with with uh, Darren Guilford on the, the 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 sort of like the follow the sequel for Tron. Yeah, uh, they made the first one. I think was released in 2010, right? They were supposed to do a sequel. Right. That was shut down. Um, but I was going on the break anyway, so it was like okay, like four months after, it's it's all right. And then from that, I went to Ghost in the Shell, straight straight up, you know, from right. that to Ghost in the Shell for like a year and a half. Wow. And then from there, I think it was another show that was like five months. But but after those, after that streak of, of shows where I was like months and months on end, most of them were like a week, a two weeks, three weeks, and then you know, oh, we're done. You know, we yeah. got what we wanted. I wonder if you if you've noticed the trend of that, like that the shows are slow, like slowly becoming like smaller and smaller in terms of like how much they need from from illustrators. Yeah, I mean. Um, it, the one of the greatest assets you can have like in the industry is like just being flexible like knowing right. that you may work on a show for two weeks you may work on a show for a year and a half and you're it's out of your power and you're yeah. you're not gonna know you're just not gonna know when that's gonna happen like um it's harder for me to kind of understand where things are these days because uh, I joined ILM Lucasfilm in uh, 2013. Uh, right. That's correct. So 
So it's harder for me to kind of know. I've been more kind of insulated into the Star Wars universe since then. Um, so we, we try to lean on artists that are already either with ILM or we kind of reach out once in a while when we're build, building our teams to, you know, to people all over the world. Um, a lot, a lot of artists in London as well. Um, and you know, I've been part of projects that, that hadn't gone very long and kind of, and then there are projects that, you know, like force awakens I was on for almost two and a half years and solo I was on for two years and, um, yeah, yeah, they, they're long projects, but they're also projects that I've been on for, for just a few weeks. Um, yeah, it's just kind of inherent to the, the industry and, you know, things just, things just change constantly and you have to be an artist, uh, willing to kind of roll with those changes for sure. Um, I mean, look at, look at where we are right now. <laughs> like, man, it's crazy. Uh, I don't know how we're all going to gonna get back on our feet, but you know, out of all of this will become some, there'll, there'll be innovation that'll, yeah, I guarantee you the industry, the industry will innovate in a way that it wouldn't have had this like terrible pandemic happen, but, um, hopefully we can all hang in there and, and be around for, uh, to see those changes. But yeah, they're, the, yeah. the industry is constantly changing. That's true. That's true. Did it, was it a giant or well, giant is a strong word was it a big change uh for you to go from being in the art department and working on like several shows and just being that that flexible artist like trying to latch on the good project and you work on it it, it gets done or shuts down you move on something else uh how different is that for you since you you joined ilm yeah i mean it's it's it, it's i haven't changed industries i've stayed within the industry yeah. even though i'm more kind of post-production um rather than the pre-production of it all beforehand even though with star wars um i've been fortunate enough to be brought on really early on those projects as well um i mean the biggest change is is being able to be part of the post-production and see all the mm -hmm. work kind of build and then be shot and then like figure out um, how to build all that in a post-production manner, um, which has been super exciting and, uh, it's been a learning experience like no other. Um, and what's interesting is to see films now, um, some of that is that those barriers are kind of breaking down of like what is pre-production and what's post-production. Right. Like a lot of that post-production is being pulled forward earlier on and vice versa. A lot of the pre-production development stuff can happen like much later, like in rise of Skywalker, we were developing worlds that hadn't really been fully fleshed out in post-production. So things are kind of, they kind of have been moving around and you know, the end product hopefully is the same, but the way we, we make these films have, have changed a little bit and kind of being part of ILM and Lucasfilm, like I've seen that change um since 2013 for sure do you guys use that technology on rise of the skywalker the unreal engine uh if, if, if i think it's called uh live sets with like the projection you're talking about projection. state yeah the stagecraft what they're doing on mandalorian yeah 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 we um we we didn't use that specific technology but we've used since like uh I think solo was the first one where we, we did projections, um, for the millennium Falcon, uh, cockpit stuff. So gotcha. we didn't, was it you, like a back projection or was it like screens that actually were I, like I, it was, screens? Um, on, I think they were, I think we were using front projection or something. I don't think we were using led screens on solo. I could be wrong, but we weren't using the media in frame. So like now, like Mandalorian, they'll, they'll have in frame media behind and that'll, that'll be yeah. the shot. So we early on, we'd use it for just reflections, gotcha. <clears throat> excuse me, and, and lighting. So if you're going through like a hyperspace tunnel, you get all the like, you know, flashing blue light and stuff on the actors and in the cockpit, yeah. but that's all it was kind of being used for at the time. But 
yeah, it's progressed um, a, a lot further along. Um, Sure. Yeah, I'm asking. I'm asking about this because when you when you said like how barriers between VFX and pre-production are shifting, <clears throat> I guess Mandalorian was the first example of that, and th this is something I've noticed that is happening in the in the film industry industry right now. I think some of the shows I have been on recently, um, and some of the shows I hear are being in development. They start to use that technology where all of a sudden. You have a situation where you have um, pre-production. You have your art department team working on, you know, making sure that everything is ready for principal photography. But then also you have VFX guys coming in and making sure that everything is actually ready from the VFX perspective for principal photography. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it. They've always had a VFX supervisor that has started early on and you know, entrench themselves with the director and, and right. the shoot. Um, but a lot of the development uh, is being of, of those VFX is being brought up earlier, earlier with like unreal and real time, yeah. uh, you know, motion capture, like all that stuff is, is happening earlier, earlier in the production. And Jim Cameron was doing it on avatar where, you know, we were, we were not only designing practical sets, but, in parallel to that, you know, uh, Pandora, the, the, the world itself, the flora and fauna and all that stuff was being developed as well. So it wasn't like right. we started one thing and, and then got into another, like all of that kind of kick started at the same time. Um, so, and I, that's not going to be for every film, obviously, but I do think for the bigger visual developed films that that's going to be the case um certainly going forward and and we're going to see an evolution of that as well i mean maybe there won't be um such a like a separate kind of department for the the shoot and then for the post-production like there's just going to be kind of a melding of all of that um, right and i think there's going to be a demand for artists that kind of can understand the whole pipeline on that level. Um, and I started on the first, uh, JJ Abrams, Star Trek movie. And the second one, I, I was fortunate enough to kind of get to know ILM a little bit, even though I wasn't working for ILM. Mm -hmm. So I would kind of help, uh, take some of these assets that we had designed and kind of see them a little further through. Um, so, I mean, in, in a way it was, it was already like that in on some movies uh even earlier on yeah so. yeah i mean it just it, it i don't think i think the mandalorian has really kind of changed that in a big dramatic way and i think that's right that's that's also a testament to from what i gather from the way john favreau shoots a movie like that's just how he wants to make a movie these days um and you'll have you'll have directors that that won't want to make them that way but you're going to have people like john favreau or jim cameron that are really kind of pushing the technology and, and right and not afraid to kind of really change it up and mix it up on how things are made just which is super exciting yeah for sure it is it is like it is making the film industry shift into um into an area that no no one have predicted or no one was like looking into that that's going to happen for sure um but also it makes it unpredictable in the, in a way as well mm. meaning like hmm what i wonder what's gonna what's going to happen next like how is that gonna affect the pipelines and yeah you know the, the design process and whatnot um and same with the with the pandemic right like the fact that the studios are shut down and location shooting is shut down i think they are reopening atlanta right now mm. meaning that there is some some development starting to happen in atlanta and probably in other locations as well so in in a way it's gonna get back to sort of like quote unquote normal sometime yeah probably this year maybe maybe next year who knows um but it is uh, yeah i i do like what you said about the fact that the innovation is going to happen. I wonder if you have any clue or inkling or your own ideas of like, do you predict what is, what is working in the film industry is going to be like mm. in upcoming years? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to say yet. 
I think we have a lot of time these days, like sitting around thinking about stuff <laughs> like that. I mean, I don't know if the idea of these huge, we'll still have big movies. We'll still have big Marvel films and big star Wars films and stuff like that. But I don't know if they'll be on the production level that, that they used to be where you'd have 150 crew members on right. stage you know, I don't know if building these huge sets for weeks and then shooting two or three weeks on the sets and then striking those sets and doing these like big kind of lo- local productions at at that studio level. Um, I do think they're going to films are going to be more nimble and they're going to figure out ways to make them quicker and maybe right. do really fast location shoots and come back and. <clears throat> do shorter compressed principal photography and do more development in post possibly and figure out ways to make your movie a little more virtual. I mean, I don't think we're there again where we're just going to put an actor again in front of green screen and build our movie. I don't think that's the way to go. I think it's, I think it's a number of, I think the more, uh, interesting ways, new ways of approaching things. And you add those to your single project, the better that if you were just to do the whole, like, well, we'll just put actors in front of green screen. We'll make the world after like, (laughs) I don't know if that's the way to go, but, but I do think there's going to be smaller crews. And what does that mean to have a smaller crew? Right. It may be stretched over multiple locations at the same time. You may have, you know, multiple points across the world, but, uh, these big tentpole movies where you're on one, uh, studio lot for, for six months. I don't know if that's the future of it all anymore. Yeah. I don't see it happening either. I mean, who knows? It's, we're all, knows? We're all guessing right now. <laughs> we're all guessing. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I hope to God we get through all this because I I know people want to like get back to work and want to like, you know, people in the film industry, we like working with other creatives. We like working with other artists. Yeah. And, you know, I know personally, I just want to get back and, you know, have FaceTime with directors and designers and artists again. Um, and, um, and we'll get there. It'll just, you know, hopefully, It'll happen sooner, sooner or later. Sooner or yeah. later. I guess more data comes out. People will see whether it's a good time or not good time. You know, who knows? Like the, the perception of what it was versus what it is. It's so dramatically different over like just a month. Yeah. So imagine how different it's going to be a month from now when we're going to have even more data to back up. Like, okay, maybe maybe we underreacted. Maybe, maybe we overreacted. Maybe we reacted the right way, but but yeah. went too far. It's, it's, yeah, we'll figure it out for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's fascinating because even even regardless of whether it's the pandemic specifically affecting the film industry or not, I think it kind of like uh, it was a good wake up call for the film. Well, not not necessarily good wake up call, but like a wake up call for film industry, like all right, this whole pipeline we have, this whole process that we're going with can be disrupted so easily that basically shuts down everything. Like we have to figure out different ways in terms of like how we conduct business. I think a lot of businesses also realize like, oh, we don't need 10,000 square feet office in middle of San Francisco to operate our company where everyone's working like much better through Zoom, Yeah, you know, or through Skype or whatever. Yeah. And um, no, I agree. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you do see like with any industry, I'm sure you do see a certain amount of like waste. Like, do we need X amount of people and X amount of like office space? As you say, like, do we need all of this to build a film? And, um, <clears throat> I don't, I don't think it's necessary. Um, I yeah. think, I think we can do it in smaller teams and be more kind of like ninja about things, go in there and get it done and get out and, um, do it with like really high powered creatives, but make it happen a lot faster. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was always a proponent work from home. Yeah, <laughs> I've been working <laughs> from home the vast majority of my film career. Yeah. Um, I, I think that Spider-Man, um, is the one that. I was commuting to, right. Um, but 
but yeah, it's for, to me, it was like, I feel just way more comfortable being at home. I can start my day when I want to start my day, you know, way more productive. I don't have this, the same amount of interruptions that I would have in the office, you know, as much as I love guy, the guys that are there and like yeah. the whole, the, the whole, uh, art department crew, some of, some of my favorite people, but it's, but it's still like, you're not in your environment. Like there's just random meetings, different interruptions. And the, the worst thing that can happen, and I, I'm pretty sure you have that too, where you're like, you're just about to get into that flow where you let that time is flying. You don't know <laughs> what, like what time it is, but you're like, just, you know, your brain is just basically sparkling with ideas and you're just throwing it all on canvas. And yeah. all of a sudden, it's like, hey, dude, like, can I see what you're doing? You know, it's like, guy, come on. <laughs> Eat it, punk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I, I've shifted in the past couple of years to where um, I'm more of a manager than anything. So I, I don't even get to draw that much anymore, which right. is it's kind of it's kind of good and bad. Like I'm in meetings when we're in like full production. I'm just in meetings all day. And mm. uh, and, you know, honestly, I there's a certain part of it that I really do like it. it. There is like the collaboration of being in a meeting and really kind of figuring out things or being in a viewing station and looking at shots. And like, I, I really enjoy all that part of it. Um, but I do also like, there'll be like, I'll get like 20 minutes or 30 minutes by myself in my office and I'll, I'll scramble to get something out and, right. And then I'll get like halfway through it and I'll be like, be pulled into something else and like, yeah, it's really hard to concentrate. So it's been nice to be at home and kind of be able to kind of be in my own office and the door closed and, yeah. um, and to like really get back into it. But, um, past couple of years, it's really just been kind of in the meeting mode and just being on the phone or on email or, um, constantly just kind of managing stuff. But yeah. Um, I do agree with one one thing that being in person with your team, uh, especially if you want to figure out like complex ideas, yeah, is is just vastly better. Well, there's also um, there's also something that happens where like you almost it happens to me all the time where I'll like misinterpret something that an artist is doing, and they're like, "No, I wasn't thinking that at all." But then through that right. misinterpretation, I'll be like, "Well, what if we did that?" Like maybe we should try that. Like hmm. that wouldn't happen if I was just in my own office by myself. Um, <clears throat> I do like kind of like talking through stuff and then seeing other people's point of views and like turning to somebody and going, I don't know what to do with this. What should we, do you have any ideas like make this better? Or they'll, they'll call me up and say, Hey, we take a look at this, um, and give me some notes on it kind of thing. Like I love that kind of back and forth. I think that just makes things stronger. Um, yeah. We're not kind of artists that always work in a bubble, but, but by doing that, we do kind of like lose a bit of sense of like ownership over it. Like you gotta have to kind of like let it go at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess it's a bo the good, the bad and the ugly, you know, like, yeah, yeah. As, as everything there's good and bad to it all. But, um, but it is kind of like, I don't know. I, I really enjoy, I enjoy working in the industry because it is constantly like changing and there's constantly new problems every day right. to solve. It's, it's really like to be an artist in the film industry, you've got to enjoy problem solving. You've got to constantly yeah. like there's a new problem that's just going to drop on your desk every day. You've got to solve it. Um, gotta be ready for it for sure <laughs> yeah yeah you gotta get in there and like solve i'm terrible at math but like i i feel like it's like an equation that you have to figure out um because there's all these like pieces like it's got to look a little bit like this it's got to feel like this here's reference here's another piece of art here's somebody's you know little scribble that they've done and you kind of have to kind of take all those pieces and make yeah. something of it how was the how was the difference uh, like what's the difference for you now when you're more in the managerial role like you're more into the uh, art director position than than you used to be before right like when you were not at ILM you 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 would just like me be mostly illustrator yeah working with production designers now kind of roles are kind of flipping for you right yeah um, 
They are. Um, I mean, I've I've been doing it a really long time, <laughs> and I think I, <laughs> I think I was looking for uh, still staying in the industry, but kind of doing a different role, um, and um, being kind of more of an art director has brought you know also like new challenges and uh, new ways of looking at things, and you're not just kind of you know with you and your machine just pumping out artwork. But I do miss like just pumping out artwork. Some <laughs> uh, I I will kind of like you know there'll be times where like if we're in early development I'll be able to kind of just do art. But then as it progresses, I kind of move into um, scribbling on onto, onto other people's art and telling them to move things left and right. <laughs> and, um, Can you just move this thing away? <laughs> scratch that out. Move that over. Make that bigger. Make that smaller split the difference. Yeah. Um, a lot of splitting the difference. A lot of like, it's not quite that much. It's not, not that little somewhere in the right. middle. Right. Right. Uh, right. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I really like it. I think, um, I do miss like, like, I feel like the moment I moved into more of an art director position, I started to kind of lose the attachment to everything. Like, like just seeing what's been done on Octane and Blender and like, I don't, I don't even know those programs. I want to kind of jump into them because I can see what people are doing with them, but I just don't, I don't have the time. Like my time is not being able to kind of, you know, like I still work in uh, the foundries moto. I work on Photoshop, but I use those because I know them and I can do it fast. I can do it kind of just messy and quick. Yeah. To get my ideas down. Um, if I could kind of have it like mind melded into my head immediately, like a new program, I'd be all for it. But like the, maybe soon. Did you watch the Joe Rogan and Elon Musk talking about the newer link? Oh, uh, were they? That's yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what it is, right? <laughs> yeah. But see, when that happens, though, like what happens to competition? Like if we all know everything, like you remove the the idea of competition, like. Then it's all genetics. Then it's all genetics, <laughs> right? I mean, if you think about it, it's like just the capacity of your genetics will determine whether yeah, you're better or not. To me, it seems like you're almost it's removing. Sad, but... You're removing any of the the creativity component. Like you're almost remove. You're pulling it down into like ones yeah. and zeros. Like it becomes binary. Like it's like somebody will just be sitting in a dark room with like a like a huge mainframe computer and being like just putting in chunks of data and like, you know, that's, that will become your visuals. Like yeah, the, the way, the reason why like alien looks the way it does is because not, it's because of uh, Ridley Scott or aliens because of Jim Cameron or, you know, Steven Spielberg doing, um, close encounters like it, the way, the reason why they look and feel like those movies is because of those people. And they're so vastly different in their ways of thinking. They're on such right. different levels. Like if we were to kind of like even out that by, by giving everybody the same amount of creativity or information. I don't think that's what it would be. It would be more of, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like, Right now, we do have an extension, so almost like a cybernetic extension of ourselves, which which are our phones, right? I mean, yeah. the amount of information, the calculation you have on your phone, your brain is just not capable of doing any of that. Sure. And the idea, I guess, behind the Neuralink was be, would be that you would have that access instantly without having a phone with you, meaning right. you can access it, your brain access that information without the... The calculation process of you picking up a phone, looking at it, and then letting your brain think about what what it's seeing sure. versus that that all that information being fed directly to your to your brain cells or you know ne- neurons. Yeah, basically. but it, it's kind of going back to what we were saying with like the amount of access we have to visuals just with like just googling any image versus having to actually research and find those images. There was this great uh, bookstore in Santa Monica called Hennessy and Ingalls. I don't know if you ever went there before. I've seen that, yeah. It was amazing, like amazing ph- photography books. Um, I don't think it exists anymore. I don't think it does, but it was like the resource for 
artists, designers, art directors do you go to like research? But you had to spend some serious time digging around and finding kind of new and interesting things. And if we had access to all of that at once, um, it, I feel like, like all the colors of the rainbow will be like reduced to just gray. Like, they'll just be like, <laughs> like part of the reason why we're all artists is not because of like our abilities. I feel like it's our disabilities. It's like, right. Like our, you know, we, we're just like, we're missing a component that makes another component even stronger. Um, and I think if we lost that, then we would lose like the creative momentum that we all have. I don't know. Yeah. First, that's perhaps what would happen. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think that Neuralink is going to be on that level anytime soon. I think the first sort of like use cases that they want to look into is like helping uh, paraplegic, paraplegic people yeah. like bypassing injuries of your, of your brain, you right. know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, which is fascinating, but yeah, when, when I was listening to that podcast, I was like, oh, that's Ghost in the Shell in a nutshell, you know, basically, basically speaking, right. that's where we're all going. I mean, we always joke that there's going to be some program where you'll be able to type in, you know, like anything, like you can type in, you know, uh, Moray Eel, type in like um, the Hawaiian Islands and type in like all these like subsets and then the AI will just take all those ideas and smash them together and then give you a randomized hybrid of all those ideas of like smashing a moray eel with the Hawaiian islands. Like right. that's coming. It's already kind of here on some levels. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I don't know, maybe I'm just an old man, but I don't know how that <laughs> reinforces telling a story. Like stories are just very human until AI is able to develop a story on their own and maybe they will. It's actually they already <clears throat> testing that they've they've actually uh, tested some of the news articles that were completely written by AI right. based on the keywords I about that. Yeah, and it, you, a random person just couldn't tell whether it was a real article or not. Yeah, so we're gonna have to get smarter and you know sharper and see those kind of those pitfalls because yeah, yeah, it's a, there's like a real danger of like our ourselves losing our ability to tell the difference between truth and like reality like it's um yeah it's kind of crazy i do think we have enough ingenuity as humans to sort of like you know all of those things are creeping on us uh, slowly but we do sort of like always if humans usually when they are in distress they almost always figure out the way out of it yeah. Whether for good or bad, you know, sometimes in the bad way, sometimes in the good way. I mean, even this pandemic is such a good example of this, like how much of uh, new treatments and, you know, new technology that came out of it just within a month, you know, of, of how people like came together and started working on, on getting this thing under control. Right. Um, and uh, as you said, like the amount of innovation that come going to come out of it, I was actually looking at 2008, the 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 economy crash mm -hmm. that was that was the time where uber lyft postmates instacart all of those delivery services like right. on demand services came out from that yeah from that time yeah and it's it's fascinating no i i i i do remain an optimist on that level i do think out of things like this as terrible and horrible as they are and the <clears throat> the amount of deaths that are happening i think innovation and the human mind finds a way to like evolve because that's what we've been doing for tens of millions yeah. of years. We've just been evolving and we evolve through, um, you know, almost a Darwinian process of like one branch is going to fail completely and die out. The other branch <laughs> is going to keep going and, uh, hopefully you're on that, that latter branch. But yeah, it, it's very, it's, innovation and, and, uh, technology is, is no different than any other kind of evolution. It's, it's going to evolve, uh, but it only will evolve when it's pressured to do so. Yeah. I think we're getting yeah. a lot of pressure to evolve right now. Yeah, dude, believe it or not, we've been talking for almost an hour and a half already. Oh my God. I, yeah. when you, when you said like an hour and a half, I'm like, 
dude, I'm going to run out of shit to say like in <laughs> five minutes. Seems, There's only so like much I be, can do. I have like a ton of questions, but we, we scheduled like not to go over too much. I know you have your family waiting for you. Yeah. yeah I have yeah. some work to do. Um, I would love to get you back on and, and talk about some of like the projects you worked on. Sure. Cause that's, that's just like a, a well of knowledge that, you know, I would love to have because, as I said in the beginning, like I'm a huge fan. I've always been. 2003 is where I when I discovered your work, and oh, you cool. were like, if you would put like top five names, you were right there in the middle, you know, in in the in the sort of like hall of fame of like this is what I need. This is why I'm learning this all stuff. You know, this is uh, why I'm becoming a digital artist. And um, that's just weird. So. Dude. That's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> but no, thank uh, you for saying that. I mean, uh, yeah. That, that's all that's all very strange to me but it it's um it only comes out of just me being like super passionate and fascinated by what other people are doing and like seeing other people's work and you know even yeah. even seeing your work recently it's gotten me kind of into like looking at there's been projects i've worked on where there is kind of a little bit more of that aesthetic of like it's not just star wars it could be it could be this it could be that right uh, right right it's just so much it's it's really nice to see instagram posts that that have a real point of view and i think your work has a real point of view which is awesome well, to see. thank you for that oh, yeah. i'm almost crying <laughs> <laughs> no it's been an absolute pleasure uh talking to you man uh cool i hope really, i didn't really blab times. on too much uh, but yeah feel free to we can do this again and get a little, maybe dig a little deeper into some specifics. Sounds good. All right. Awesome. Man. Well, let me uh, wrap it up then. Uh, thanks for everyone for listening, watching, and uh, thanks James for being here. Obviously, if you enjoyed the content, um, obviously the best thing you can do is subscribe, hit that notification to know when the new podcasts are coming up. And uh, yeah, uh, is there anything you would want to plug in uh, before we before we wrap? Like your Not, social media handles, your website. I mean, uh, all I've got. Don't I, I don't have a website right now. Uh, there's a whole story behind that which I'd love to go into because there's. I found JamesKlein.com and it's not it's, you. <laughs> it's not me. It's like, and I've been trying to find out who it is. It's so random. Like, the links go nowhere. It, it's a total. Uh, somebody picked up my jamescoin.com after I kind of ended it before going to ILM and uh, like I've been trying to figure out how to get it back but yeah Instagram is probably the place that I put most of my work these days uh, Klein Design um, you find it there yeah for sure perfect I'll list it here as well awesome cool man thanks James yeah good time we'll have a great weekend alright bye ciao cool that's it